And now, on Prophetic Faith. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to another week's broadcast here at Prophetic Faith. I am Pastor Robbie Barrett, and tonight we're going into a brand new series dealing and teaching with what love is all about. Now, I know that we live in a society today that can tell you everything about everything of what love is. And what God wanted me to do with this series, He said, I want you to teach my people what love is truly means because I'm telling you the world has twisted this it has manipulated it to such a degree that now most people in society and even in church they don't know what love is so this message is really gonna bless you tonight this part is dealing with the fact or the truth I should say that love is demanding and requires much now I know you haven't heard that before so let's get into the message and I will see you at the end of the program now look at Acts 17 for me. It says, For in Him we do what? We live. We move. We have our being. So right away, I want you to understand and see that God is not a hobby. He's not just a hobby. He's not an afterthought. He's not something that we take up when we have spare time or free time. In Him we live. We move. We have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We are his children. Next verse. It says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not, or we ought, ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone or graven by art or man's device. Next verse. For the times of the ignorance, God winked. I want you to see that right now. Now listen to me very closely. There was a time where God winked at our lukewarmness, at our halfway given efforts. How many knows that there is a time that God winks when we don't give Him our best? In other words, He makes allowances. He gives us grace. There's a season where God says, okay, I know you got a lot going on, and I'm going to give you some grace period to get yourself together. But watch this. But now, somebody say now. But now He commandeth all men everywhere to do what? To repent. Do you know what that word repent means? To say you're sorry. No. That word repent means to literally change direction. So if you're going in this direction, when you repent, you turn and you begin to go in this direction. So, and this is one thing that God deals with me all the time, is that you can't go in one direction and then go in another direction. You have to make up your mind. Now, God has placed on me in an agenda to come against a spirit that has creeped into the church. Now, when I say the church or the body of Christ, I am not speaking to a specific church or denomination. I'm talking about everywhere that considers himself a church that has been raised up by Jesus Christ himself, who is the head of the church. Amen? I'm dealing with the church as a whole. I'm coming against the Spirit today, and I'm telling you right now, there is a Spirit that has slipped into the church, and it is causing many preachers to preach something that is contrary to the Word of God. Now you say, what is this Spirit that has creeped into the church? This Spirit has convinced us 
to give God, that it's perfectly okay to give God our scraps. How many knows what I'm talking about? I'm talking about this spirit that has creeped into the church that has convinced us that it's okay to give God maybe 5% of our effort. Come on. That, that we don't have to give God everything anymore. That that time of sacrificing all and giving God our best, that doesn't apply to today. Because God understands, right? He understands that we have busy schedules. He understands that we have jobs. He understands that we have families. He understands all this other stuff. So it has convinced us that we don't have to give God our best. Amen? Now, you can say amen or oh me, whatever you want to say in here today. But that spirit has creeped into the church. And it has convinced us that we can be faithless. We can be inconsistent. And we can be lukewarm. Right? Or maybe we can give God nothing at all. It just depends on how busy our schedule is. Now, listen here. God said for a season He winked at all this. He winked at our faithlessness. He he winked at our inconsistency. He winked at our lukewarmness. But now, as Revelation declared, He said, I want you, the lukewarmness is done with. And I'm telling you right now that this is a season in the body of Christ where God is done with halfway in, halfway out. Somebody say amen. He is done with lukewarmness. He has now come to the place where He said, just as He said in Revelation, He said, I either want you cold or I want you hot. But I am no longer going to accept lukewarmness. Come on, somebody, say amen. I'm no longer going to accept a halfway effort. You want my best? How many wants the best of God? You better raise your hand. Everybody wants the best of God. God says, I want your best. I want your best effort. I want all of you. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, all of you. Why? Because there is an awakening here. How many remembers what God prophesied a few months ago? He said, prepare yourself, get ready, because an awakening is going to hit this nation. An awakening is going to hit the world. An awakening of what? To spirituality, to the things of God, to the kingdom of God. And this is what God said. He said distractions were going to be removed from people. False gods were going to fall. People's hearts were going to burn for Him again. Somebody say amen to this stuff. How many knows we need this today? We need distractions to be removed. Come on. We need false gods. Now, when we think of the word idols, we think of setting up some gold or silver image. No, no, no. It's whatever you place in your life that takes the place of God. Oh, I can't come to church. Oh, I can't read the Word. I can't do what God has called me to do because of this or because of that. That's your idol. Somebody say amen today. That's your idol. And God says false idols are going to fall. Distractions are going to be removed. And this is what He said too. He said people's hearts are going to be set on fire for me again. Why is it now, if you notice in church, we, we almost got to coax people into worshiping. Come on, we got to try to pep everybody up to praise God. Let me tell you something, when your heart is after Him, nobody has to tell you to lift your hand. Nobody has to tell you to worship. Come on, somebody. Nobody has to tell you to serve God. You want to. Amen? You want to. Go to Mark 12, 30. Look at this right here. He says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the what? The first commandment. Now here's the point, or here's the part where everybody says, oh, I know what love is. Right? It's real quiet in here today, so I know you really listen, which is what I want. This is exactly what I want from you today. Now listen, everybody thinks they know what love is, right? What's, what's, 
just about everybody's favorite scripture when it deals with love. They go to 1 Corinthians 13, don't they? Right? Oh, and they especially love the Amplified Classic Version. Right? It talks about what love is. Love is not proud. Love is not arrogant. Love is kind. Love is gentle. All this other. And that's what everybody loves. Oh, love does not demand its own way. That's the NLT. Go to the NLT real quick. Look at what the NLT says, the New Living. It says it's not rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wrong. These are the scriptures that people love to talk about when they talk about love. And, and they'll say things like, you know, love doesn't demand its own way. Right? How many's ever heard that? Love doesn't demand its own way. Are you sure about that? Now I want you to think real hard before you answer that. Are you sure that love doesn't demand its own way? Are you sure that love doesn't require much? Because we're being taught in this generation that love doesn't demand anything. Come on. We're being taught today that love doesn't require anything. Come on. You can be in love with this person today and be in love with that person tomorrow. Right? We use love as a as an easy expression for things. I love the chair. I love this. I love that. Right? That's what it's come to. <clears throat> and we're in a generation where everybody thinks they know what love is. So we use that expression. Love does not demand its own way. Right? It doesn't matter. Listen, love's not demanding. It doesn't matter if I come to church or not. Because love is not demanding, right? It doesn't matter if I'm doing what God has called me to do or not, whether I'm doing what I'm called to do or whether I'm not. It doesn't matter because love's not demanding. You see where I'm getting at today? This is the language that people talk, and they think they know what love is. They think they know what love is. But what if I told you that we have not fully grasped the love of God? Now, I know you're getting ready to say, well, yeah, Pastor, because the Bible says that we don't fully understand the love of God. It surpasses all understanding. That's not what I mean. We've been looking at it the wrong way. So Jesus, listen, Jesus did not say that He was a way. Is that right? He didn't say that He's a way. He said that He is the way. Amen? So, let me say it to you like this. <clears throat> Love does not demand its own way. It demands the way. It demands a certain criteria. <clears throat> it demands a certain standard. How many wants to fully understand what love is today? Raise your hand. Then I want you to listen to this message. <clears throat> Love doesn't demand its own way. Are we sure about that? Go to John 6, 53. I want you to read with me here. We're going to go all the way to 66. <clears throat> it says, And Jesus said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Except you eat of my flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you shall have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drink my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drink of my blood dwells in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, I live by my Father, or by the Father. So he that eateth of me, even, she, even he shall live by me. And this is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. 59. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. And many of their, therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear this? Or we would say like this. 
Who can accept something like this? This is too fanatical. This is too crazy. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said, does this offend you? What? And if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. There are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who were them that believed not and who should betray Him. And He said, Therefore I say unto you that no man can come unto Me except it were given unto My Father. And from that time, many of His disciples went back and walked no more with Him. <clears throat> Love doesn't demand its own way. Is that right? Well, here is love himself manifested in human form. What's another famous scripture that everybody loves? God is love, right? Well, this is love manifested in human flesh. And here's what he says. He says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no part in me. Love is demanding and it requires much. This was not Jesus standing up here saying, Hey, however you want to serve me, whatever you think is best, that's fine because I love you. That's not what He said. He said, unless you give me all of you, and, and unless you get totally submerged in me, you cannot have a part in me. So I'm going to ask you again. Are you sure that love is not demanding? Because here is a passage that is letting you know that love demands and requires much. When they heard this saying, they said, who can receive this? Who can accept it? This is too hard. Right before this passage, this was when Jesus had fed the 5,000. How many knows that when God first calls you to Him, He blesses you? Come on. He shows you His goodness. He shows you His mercy. He does all those things. But then there comes a time where God says, Okay, it's time for you to make me first in your life. Come on, somebody. It's time that you give me all of you. And this is what Jesus was doing. He had fed the 5,000. He had blessed them. He had shown, him his, uh, shown them His goodness and His mercy. And then He came to the point where He says, Okay, listen, this is what I require of you. You have to partake of all of me. You have to give me all of you. For you to continue to abide in me, for you to, for you to walk with me, you have to be sold out. Are you getting this this morning? So he's calling us to a place where he is all that matters. Amen? He's calling us to a place where we says, you know what? It's no longer about our agenda. It's about his agenda. Amen? It's about what He wants. So love is demanding and it requires much. Matthew 10, 37. He says, He that loveth his father or his mother more than me is not worthy of me. Oh, you know Jesus, He was just about love. He never pressured anybody. He never placed any demands on anybody. He just come to serve. He just How many knows the language that everybody wants to talk? <clears throat> oh, Jesus never judged anybody. He just loved everybody. He, that's all He did was just show love. He stands up and He makes a statement. He says, He that loves His father or His mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves His children more than me is not worthy of me. Verse 38. He that taketh not his cross and follow after me 
is not worthy of me. Say this with me. Love is demanding and it requires much. Love Himself was demanding absolutely to be number one in our lives. Let me say it again. God is not your afterthought. He is not if you get time on the weekend. Come on, somebody. God says, I have to be number one in your life. Because, come on, is this too hard for us? Is this requiring too much? When He gave us His most precious thing that He had so that we would be saved from an eternal hell. Come on. The Bible says there was nothing more precious. And watch this. He didn't do this when we had it all together. He didn't do this when we were good. Come on. He did this when we were yet sinners. Somebody knows the Bible in here. Say amen. He did this when we were yet sinners. The Bible says He sent His Son to die for us. Is it too much to ask that He requires all? The answer is no. Now watch. This verse is telling you something. Go back to verse 37. What, the, what he is saying here is this. When you try to put me in any other place but first, it will always cause problems for you. How many, know, how many loves their wife or their husband? How many loves their mom and their dad? How many loves their children? Absolutely. And we are instructed to do so. How could we not? But when we place people in front of God, come on. It will always cause problems for you. When we place a job or a career, when we place a sport or a hobby, whatever, when we place things in front of God, it will always cause problems. God demands to be number one. Turn to your neighbor and say, He demands it. See, watch this. I know that love is a choice. Don't misunderstand me. I know that love is a choice. God gives us a choice. He gave you a choice whether you would come today or not. He gave you a choice. He didn't force you. Love does not force, but love demands absolute. How many is interested in getting married and standing before that altar and having your husband or your wife say, I might love you? I might be faithful. Praise God. Are you glad that God is teaching us about what love is? Again, as I stated at the beginning of this program, the world has twisted the definition of what it means, the interpretation of what love is to such a degree that it is hard for us to pinpoint what love actually is. But as we learn tonight, and we're going to learn next week, that love is demanding. Now, when we hear about love, people will tell you, well, love doesn't require anything from you. Love doesn't expect anything from you. Of course it does. God loved us, and what does He expect in return? He expects us to love Him in return. He expects us to serve Him. Jesus made this statement. Now, if if you think that love is not demanding and requires much, listen to what Jesus said. He told the people that day, He said, Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no part of me. Would you agree with me that love is demanding and requires much? See, that's what we do with our loved ones, our spouse. We require things from them. Why? Because that's what love is supposed to do. And we do this in return. They do it for us. So, I want to pray for you right now that God through this series will begin to open up to you and reveal to you new levels of love. Because I'm telling you that love is one of the greatest power, the greatest force that man has ever known. As a matter of fact, Jesus, or excuse me, God made this statement in His Word. He said, I am love. Think about that. God doesn't have love. He is love. 
So it's very important, if you would agree with me tonight, that it's very important that you and I know what love truly means. Let's pray. Father, I pray for every person right now, Lord, that they would see your love as it is, not being, not being twisted by the enemy. I know the enemy has tried to twist things. He's tried to pervert things. But, Father, I want you to show them your love as it is. For you so loved the world that you sent your only begotten Son, that when we put our faith and our trust in Him, we will not perish, but we will have everlasting life. And that's not just talking about when we get to heaven. Father, you've given us life right now. You want your people healed. You want them blessed. You want them delivered and set free. So, Lord, I thank you tonight that as your love is being poured out, that people are going to experience the goodness of you, and I give you the praise for this now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. I want to take this time as I do every single week and thank our faith partners. Faith partners, thank you for your continued giving and support of this ministry. What we're doing right now, <clears throat> you, help, you help make this possible. As you sow into this ministry, we're able to take this gospel, this good news, to as many people as we possibly can. People that are hurting, people that need a breakthrough, people that need to know how good this God is. And you allow us to do that. So we want to thank you for that. And if you're watching tonight and you would like to become a faith partner, it's very, very easy. Our announcer is getting ready to come on the screen. And he's going to, sh to tell you all the information on how you can become a faith partner and partner with this ministry. And as we go, you go with us. So until then, keep walking by faith. I'll see you right here. Be blessed. If you would like to become a faith partner, please contact us at P.O. Box 264, Tazewell, Virginia 24651. You may also reach us at 276-971-2333. You may also request information at AccelerateFaith.org. Our email for faith partners are faithpartner at AccelerateFaith.org as well. command the lame to walk. We command it in the name of Jesus. The devil is a liar.